Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. Today, I am here with Ubi Petrus. Uh, Ubi Petrus is a rising kind of star in the Eastern Orthodox uh, world of apologetics. So I'm excited to have him. And today we're going to talk about the ecumenical councils. Now, let me be upfront in saying that, you know, I'm not an expert on the ecumenical councils. And, um, you know, I became Catholic last uh, Pentecost. So I'm kind of new to a lot of, uh, a lot of these discussions. Uh, most of my research and work has focused on the um, first century scriptures and then um, the church fathers only within living memory of the apostles. So the writings that are about 150 years from the last apostle, John. Um, so with that being said, I'm excited to have Ubi on and Ubi is going to kind of give me a master class. That's, that's what I'm hoping for. And then we'll eventually go debate the scriptures on his channel. Um, later, and you'll see that um, perhaps uh, I can put that in the link. But uh, Ubi, how are you doing today? I'm doing well today. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm really good. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited to, to have you on. So um, Ubi, can you begin by just describing what got you into apologetics, you know, especially for Eastern Orthodoxy? Well, first, let me say I am also very excited to be on your show. And it's a pleasure to meet you and to get to know you. Um, and, uh, I'm, if it makes you feel better, I'm not an expert in anything, <laughs> um, except perhaps eating pepperoni pizza. I'm quite good at that, but, uh, I'm just someone who, uh, likes to read, you could say. So what first got me involved was years and years ago. Well, not actually not that long ago. Uh, some people came to me with some articles from Eric Ibarra and they said, do you have a response to these? And I said, yeah, sure. So I gave them some answers. I typed some things up. They liked them. They shared them amongst their friends. From there, it got rolling. And then I thought, okay, why not just start a blog? And we started a blog, largely at Lewis's insistence. We did not get into making videos until there was we did a stream with Jay Dyer, and this is probably about, I think it was January, perhaps February of last year. And uh, in response to that, uh, Eric and uh, Michael Lofton and uh, Elijah Yossi did a, a response to us. And at that point we went, well, we have to make videos now. <laughs> so we just, we made a video and some people liked it and so then we made another video and some people liked it we made another and then, so now we have i think five we have three more in production right now wow hmm. yeah and so I mean, the videos take a long time to make i mean i appreciate too like um i mean one is so one is that you're not doing this entirely alone like you have friends that are helping you out is that correct make the videos that's correct. Lewis yeah. does a fantastic job mm -hmm. on all of the uh, visual and the editing. And, and then um, a friend of ours, Orthodox Pilgrim, he does the narration. Um, he has a, a wonderful voice. Mm -hmm. Believe me, you do not want to hear two hours of narration in my voice. It's, <laughs> it's horrible. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, they do a great job. And, and, uh, uh, we have many friends who send in material who comb through various works for us. I mean, really it's a collaborative effort and uh, we have really great viewers. The, the mm -hmm. viewers we have, they do whatever they can to help. They're tremendous people. Yeah. So you're kind of like the, the central brain of the operation, right? And uh, is that correct? Uh, you could say I'm perhaps the, the backbone of it. I don't know about the brain. Um, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not very bright. So, uh, but uh, it would be a very small brain if I were the brain, but mm. uh, you could send perhaps the backbone. All right. All right. So Ubi, I think, um, I think I'm ready to start diving into our discussion on the councils. So, um, I mean, there, there's a lot that we can talk about because this is like, you know, over a thousand years of church history, you know, and obviously we're not mm -hmm. going to hit everything, but um, I guess maybe a good place to start is Vatican I itself. And in particular, mm -hmm. um, you know, based on kind of um, your interpretation and how the Orthodox have received the first Vatican Council, how do they uh, see the relationship, at least according to Rome, 
of the Roman pontiff to the bishops? What what are they what do they see a Rome claiming about itself in the First Vatican Council? You mean from our perspective, what do right. we see Rome yeah. saying its role is uh well, I mean the the coloring book and crayons version of what we think is that Rome claims that it can be an infallible autocrat. Mm -hmm. um, I know there's nuance to it. There's tremendous nuance to it. Um, for yeah. example, the Bishop of Rome must have, um, he must consult the consent of the church. He doesn't need their permission, but he's under some sort of a moral obligation to consent or to consult the consent of the church, whether that consent comes in studying the scriptures or studying patristic texts or even going so far as to ask the bishops. Um, he has a moral obligation to seek some sort of advice. Now, whether or not he chooses to accept that advice is entirely up to him. Mm -hmm. um, so we would see that as a dangerous proposition. Now, I know for Roman Catholics, they believe that the, the Catholic Church could never go wrong, that Rome never could go wrong when speaking on the matter of faith and morals and seeking to bind all Christians. So there's that for Catholics that go, well, as dangerous as it is, God will not allow this bad thing to happen. Mm -hmm. For us, because we do not believe God would stop that bad thing from happening in the case of the Pope, it just looks like a free fall for us. Mm -hmm. If you don't mind too, so for the Orthodox, right, they would kind of, they would accept the kind of the indefectibility or the infallibility of the church at large or the entire church, but they wouldn't locate that upon any singular bishop. Is that correct? Correct, correct. Okay. We would locate it upon the body of bishops, the episcopacy itself, and how we come to that is we can get into later on, but sure. we would not place it upon one person. Right, so Vatican I, uh, it defines papal infallibility, and of course, then it also makes claims about papal supremacy. So, I mean, I mean, it seems to me that infallibility kind of flows from supremacy, um, because if you're mm -hmm. going to say that this one guy, right, can declare doctrine ex cathedra um, without needing, um, with, and the cause of what makes his declaration infallible is not the bishops or their consent, the manifest consent, but it's God himself through the commission given to Peter. Um, one of the questions I ask is, so what would you consider autocratic then about papal supremacy or, or what strikes you as autocratic in papal supremacy? So an autocrat is someone who can do things without the permission of others. Mm -hmm. uh, they can simply bulldoze through, right? So in the case of the Pope, um, I believe it's the, well, Okay, we'll get to that later, but um, it says states that the Pope can use this privilege whenever he sees fit at yeah. his pleasure. Immediately, right? Um, yeah. And you see, yeah, and immediately, right? He can have free discourse with any of the believers. The question is, what is there to stop him? Mm -hmm. what, what are the checks and balances? I'm not aware of any. Right, except when there's no checks yeah. and balances mm -hmm. to someone, there's autocracy. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing that right now in, in the US as, as slowly the checks and balances are worn away and worn away and worn away. We're, we're rocketing towards autocracy. So it's not like I'm looking at the US government as some model. No, mm -hmm. um, I'm not. Right. And then, so could you explain also? Um... I mean, so I think this is now going to get into um, how the Orthodox interpret the Petrine Commission or the Petrine Ministry itself. Mm -hmm. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, so what is there something like in principle that stops the Orthodox from saying that God could make this one individual bishop infallible? Um, or is it because like the biblical witness seems to not necessarily support it? So what's the what's the historic kind of or even, you know, contemporary or Orthodox um reasoning behind not accepting that one bishop could be infallible? Well, because the episcopacy itself is what the church is built upon. Yeah, okay. And so we see that everything was done. We look at Acts 15, they, mm -hmm. they, they meet together, right, in a council, it says it has seemed good 
to us, right? They were all in common on it. And uh, this is even how the Sanhedrin worked. Mm-hmm. Well, actually the Sanhedrin worked by a, by a majority vote, but it was still the idea of a council. The high priest could not just come in there and bulldoze through. Absolutely not. But so we take that, that notion as the beginning um, statement. The other thing is that, and I know this is sort of a, this comes off as a trite argument, but we have ecumenical councils for a reason. If the Pope can simply speak infallibly, why doesn't he just send a letter out to some bishops who, from whom he wants advice, looks at what they have to say, and then makes a decree on his own? I mean, really, if God is going to protect him from error, why doesn't he do that? Why go through the trouble of bringing all these bishops to Rome or to whichever council to pull them away from their flocks for months and years at a time if all you could do is just write a few letters, get some advice, and then make a decree? It's not not a, a coincidence that the one council that came after Vatican I was a pastoral council. Mm -hmm. That's how we look at it. Now, I could be proven wrong. I mean, maybe Pope Francis will call a council and make some sort of doctrinal decree or dogmatic decree, I I don't know. But as far as I can see, from the very history itself, we have councils. We have the fact that the church is built upon the episcopacy. I mean, it's it's uh, uh you know the keys the keys to the kingdom are something that the episcopacy owns right it's something that's sacramental being made the pope is not sacramental therefore the reference point is the bishops itself now i know in catholic ecclesiology that the bishops are allowed to use the keys insofar as they are in union with the roman pontiff that that gives a legitimacy yeah to their usage of them um, but that they are possessed in virtue of the bishops being successors to the apostles. Yeah. Um, so I would say that. All right. So then, I mean, this kind of, uh, uh, I think this is a nice kind of starting point then, because I've noticed that for in, in my conversations with a lot of my Catholic friends who have watched your content, um, one major critique that I often find is that they say, you know, it seems as if Ubi, when he looks at history or the councils, um, he's assuming that, you know, the Pope would just settle everything by himself, right? Or, or you know, he, uh, to, to quote, you know, Yabara, like he'd be Rambo on all doctrine, right? But it seems as if like um, the Pope is at liberty, so to speak, to exercise his power when he sees fit or when he feels obliged to, but then more often than not, what he'll do is he'll just work with an ecumenical council or he'll work with his brother bishops. So I guess um, my question would be now, as we get into now the the councils and uh, the work that you've done, what would you expect from history if Vatican I were true? I would expect to see the Pope defining doctrine on his own in the same way that he defined the uh, Immaculate Consumption, or uh, sorry, <laughs> Immaculate Conception and the yeah. Assumption of Mary into heaven. Mm-hmm. Um, I would assume to see him doing things like that. Now, part of it, and, and it's ironic that Eric Ibarra says that, right? Because if you read his material, he argues for this Rambo-like character. (laughs) So it's really ironic that he's the one who goes, oh, how dare Ubi just look for some sort of Rambo-like character. Oh, by the way, here's the Pope being Rambo over here. Mm. Uh, I mean, if you read Satis Cognitum, it makes this case for a Rambo-like character. And when you read, you know, authors like, you know, Fortescue or Chapman or, or Giles. Um, Giles is actually an Anglican, um, but he was an Anglo-Catholic. I mean, they make this case for the for the Rambo for Pope Rambo. Now we have no problem admitting that the Pope held this very high position that he was the head of the synod that you needed his vote, a positive vote, to pass something 
in the synod um, or really even no problem with saying that the Pope could be the one who calls ecumenical synods. We have no issue with saying that bishops from around the world or clerics can appeal to the Bishop of Rome if they're, um, if they are deposed, that's the, Sardican, the canons of Sardica in 343, and the Pope can then act as a review court, and he can then decide to send it to an actual appeals court. The, the, the important thing to understand is that the Sardican canons did not set the Pope up as, a, as an appeals court. They did not. They set him up as a review court. That is a court that decides whether or not something can even go to appeals. The appeals courts were located in the provinces adjacent to the province of the deposed cleric. And it was set up as a rule. Um, we have no problem with any of that, but um, what we do have a problem with is what comes across as, as Pope Rambo. Um, collecting all of that power into one person, well, it's great if you have a great Pope, but it's like any monarchy. When you find weak rulers or when you come across weak rulers, they, they wreak havoc. And I think the Catholic Church is, is seeing this right now. It's, it's not that Pope Francis, well, he is doing a lot of damage, um, but I mean, he's packing the uh, College of Cardinals. I mean, what do you think that means for what the next Pope is going to be like? Um, many of my Catholic friends and, and family are very terrified. What does this mean? I mean, he's, he's picked cardinals who share his ideology, which is more or less liberation theology. And uh, who do you think they're going to pick for the next Pope? I hope to God it's not someone like him. I hope it's a staunch conservative because, uh, and I, I know this sounds odd coming from someone who's Eastern Orthodox, but um, Western civilization comes or goes with the Catholic Church. And if the Catholic Church falls, um, I mean, the, <laughs> that's the main institution in the West. If that falls apart, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be an absolute disaster, even more than now. It's, it's going to be further sinking into nihilism, into Marxism, um, further into materialism. Um, and so I do not take joy in pointing out the problems in the Catholic Church. Um, and I would hope, for, and, and by the way, I don't hope that Protestant churches go, do well. I don't. I hope those things fail miserably. I can't stand that. Protestantism is, oh, they're Nestorian monothelite iconoclasts who are emotional train wrecks. It's a heresy born in the bowels of hell. But for Catholicism, I would like to see it do well. Uh, if for no other reason, Western civilization was preserved by the Catholic Church. And uh, it's the main institution in the Catholic Church. And I think that a fall of the Catholic Church would be something on par with the fall of the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I am absolutely terrified to say it, but I think that we're watching that right now. I think that Pope Francis is just the beginning. Now, I do not encourage anyone. I mean, I do not encourage anyone to leave the Catholic Church because of Pope Francis. If you want, I, once in a while I get people who say, well, I don't like Pope Francis, so I'd like to become Eastern Orthodox. No, that's a horrible reason. <laughs> A horrible reason. Those people, that, I'll tell you who's like that. People, Michael Lofton is like that. People who, they have these constant purity tests. Wherever they go, it's not good enough. And so they just become these really dissatisfied converts in your parish. Um, I, I do not think that, that Pope Francis's actions are a a reason to leave the Catholic Church. I think that Pope Francis's actions are an example of how dangerous the Catholic ecclesiology can be, can be, right? But I do not think that he himself is just some sort of refutation of Catholicism. All right, wow, that, Ubi, that was a lot to take in all at once, but I appreciate the, uh, the very thorough answer. Um, so what I wanna do oh, now is you. I just, I wanna highlight kind of some of the things we agree on. Right. And I think this is important. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, so one thing is that we kind of look at each other as um, kind of 
I guess, what's the best way of putting it? Kind of like distant brothers, perhaps. So like we, we have a, this, we, we, you know, we accept apostolic succession. We accept the importance of the historical apostolic deposit. Um, we accept, you know, the, the, the ecumenical councils, the teachings of the councils, right? We, we, we basically, I think, have the same theory of justification and the centrality of the sacraments, right, mm -hmm. to, to our life. Um, so, so then if I, if I, if I understand properly then, so you would say that, um, like, I think I've heard other people say this, like the Bishop of Rome, the Roman pontiff has fallen into heresy, right. Um, with respect to what he's claimed of himself and, and so on and so forth. Um, but then you also acknowledge that he had some type of supervisory role throughout history. But I think, you know, Jay Dyer pointed out in his debate with uh, Eric that, you know, people could also appeal to Alexandria and other places. So it wasn't just only Rome. So could you go into the history then mm -hmm. of kind of the development of the, of the Roman kind of uh, the Roman mana episcopacy? So just throughout history, how did Rome begin? And then what did Rome eventually become? Well, should we start at Romulus and Remus or St. Peter? Uh, do you want to start at Romulus? I mean, that's, uh, easy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, well, if it has relevance, at, right? But let, maybe Peter. Peter is the better place to start. <laughs> well, I do like Roman history, so I'm tempted to actually start at Aeneas. But um, no, the uh, so, you know, St. Peter ends up in the city of Rome, and Rome is the largest city in the empire, and it's a, it's a complete consumer. It produced very little, but consumed everything. And uh, it was such a, a special city, and you're, you're a Latinophile as well. You also love Latin language. We've talked about this. You know that um, there are special grammatical rules around the name for the city of Rome. Uh, I mean, they, they really took it quite seriously. And so it's only natural that Saints Peter and Paul would end up in Rome. It's only natural that apostles would end up in Alexandria and in Antioch and in all these major cities, because that's where you're going to find large congregations of Jews. Jews have historically been a mercantile class and a mercantile class, uh, they do not exist much in the countryside. Um, and so they would go looking for communities of Jews, which would, of course, attract uh, God-fearing Gentiles. And those would be really a, a ripe ground for conversions. Um, the situation in the Roman church was that it was known for being very, very wealthy, largely because of the converts it had made um, among many, specifically among noble women. Uh, women tend to be uh, prone to convert to Christianity, uh, women and soldiers actually were a very large subgroup of converts within Christianity, noble women and soldiers, very, very interesting. Uh, and so you are bound to see a lot of connections to Rome based simply off of the charity that the Roman church was able to offer. Uh, there was a statistic or a, a citation I saw many years ago about the Church of Rome in the time of St. Cyprian. Uh, it had something like 35,000 members. So this is mid third century, had about 30 in the city of Rome and it supported about 5,000 widows, orphans, and disabled. That, that's tremendous. 5,000 widows, orphans, and disabled. They were supporting. I mean, that takes a tremendous amount of generosity and a and a very centralized system to organize that. Um, I would say, what, what was the rest of your question? I'm sorry. Well, I mean, so it, it was just basically kind of tracing the development of the uh, the Roman episcopacy throughout history. So, I mean, you were doing a great job of that already because a lot of the stuff you were saying. Um, because of the the things that I've studied uh, on the first century in the early church in Rome, what you're saying checks out. Um, and so I'm really I'm really appreciative of the fact that you've actually you've actually studied uh, this particular area. So it's good to hear um, that you know what you're talking about. So, um, oh, thank you. Yeah. So I mean, do you want to? You were you're talking about um, before before you asked me. You were talking about a uh, 
kind of the, the, the charitable work that was done in Rome. Right. Okay. Yeah. Right. You, so it's, yeah. uh, do you mind if I jump sorry, ahead continue. a little bit? Sure. Of course. Yeah. Sure. So, so now we can, so, you know, we, we understand that Rome in the beginning did charitable work, as you pointed out, noble women and soldiers, but also, you know, Clement of Rome, who is a big figure. And we can talk about Clement perhaps. Um, Clement, right, came, we, what we know about him was that he, he came from like a wealthy background. He was known for his evangelistic zeal. It appears that he knew Paul and Peter, uh, you know, mm -hmm. as you know, in Philippians 4.3. Um, and uh, Clement, right, writes first Clement, second Clement is attributed to him, but it's probably not authored by him. Um, and so there we start to see kind of, um, at least the development of something like an episcopacy in Rome. Now, do mm -hmm. you, would you believe, okay, so would you accept that Clement is a successor of Peter? Of course. Okay. Yeah. Cause, uh, the Eastern Orthodox, they don't deny, uh, Petrine successors. Um, no, we do not. Right. Uh, yeah. So, and also most of the debates that I've done have been with Protestants. So usually I have to kind of like, be like, okay, yeah. So we agree on a lot more. So we got to fine tune the details. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So then, um, and then you would agree that, um, Clement was ordained by Peter. I would have to look at the list of succession that St. Irenaeus lays out again. Right, uh, right. I think it's Saint, but his varies slightly from the other ones. I believe he says, was it Peter, Linus, and then Clement? I can't yeah. remember. He, yeah, he jumps over and then a I few. Think, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then, but yeah, there's, uh, by the way, many, probably most of the first popes were from a noble background. Mm. And the reason is that uh, they were highly literate. Yeah. And they would be skilled in administration. And they would oftentimes have the funds to support the community if the community somehow fell afoul of, of a major donor or major donors. They would be able to, you know, pull on their friends and family's heartstrings to get money. The other thing is that if you get someone who's in a noble family and persecutions break out, you have the connections to get those to stop or to ease up or to maybe be more official and on paper than anything else. So it was very much in the interest of the community to find a nobleman. And from the Greek in Clement's letter, you can tell this man was tremendously well-educated. Mm -hmm. And you can tell that he was probably also a Jew because of his familiarity with the Old Testament. Right, right. That's a yeah. familiarity that you don't typically find among even Gentile converts yeah. to Judaism. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Um, okay, so now we get into the second century, and uh, we we arrive at, for instance, Irenaeus. And Irenaeus, aside from the fact that he mentions, you know, Petrine successors, he mm -hmm. there's a there's a commonly like I think I know you were I think you know where I'm going with this, but there's like a commonly debated quote from Irenaeus, where he talks about like um, something like um, you know uh, every church right should obey this church and. This church here, he's talking about Rome, right? Um, but the problem is that we don't have the right. original Greek that Irenaeus wrote in. So we don't know right. if he's saying, because we have the Latin, right? But we don't know if he's saying this church as in this particular Roman church, or he's saying a church such as or like the Roman church, as if the Roman church is an example or a type, but not necessarily the only one. So I'm interested on... Um, how you view Irenaeus's um, praise of Rome. Um, so, I mean, you would, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that you would accept like Rome was clearly like one of the preeminent apostolic sees, perhaps from the very beginning. Right. Well, from the very beginning, it would be, right? Right. I mean, because of the death of, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or just simply because, if nothing else, it was the largest city in the empire. I mean, Keep in mind that the Romans, when they spoke about it, okay, so there's two words in Latin, as you know, for a city, right? There's urbs, right? Mm -hmm. That's where we get urban from. And the name urban, by the way, like Pope Urban, uh, it doesn't actually mean a city dweller. It means someone from the city of Rome. Mm -hmm. And the reason is Rome was the only true urbs, right? All other cities or opidum, or opidai in the plural, opidum, and that literally means a village. Mm -hmm. 
So the Romans looked at cities like, you know, Trier, Nicomedia, Alexandria, and they're all villages. They're all villages. <laughs> right. So so you have something there that that is the city. It is the it is the only city, right? Now, um, I would say that uh, you know the early Christians. Uh, I'm trying to pull something up here that I can give you. Um, the early Christians would have uh, valued Rome, uh, not least of which because it was a major city of the empire. Yeah. Uh, you could not bring weapons into the city. Um, one of the reasons why Julius Caesar could be killed when he was is because the um, regular meeting place of the Senate was under construction. So they had to meet outside the Pomeranium. And uh, they were therefore allowed to bring weapons in, but soldiers were not allowed to come in with their, um, their weaponry or their armor or anything. It was a sacred space to them. So you definitely have some of that pouring over you know, you're, you're going to have that in the in the background of the mind of a lot of these converts, and, and then you have the two main apostles, Peter and Paul. They're both martyred there. Their bodies reside there. Their grace exuding bodies reside there. Right there, the sacred grace exuding bodies of the apostles. So of course, it's a special place. Of course, it's a uh, you, you might say it's a, a magical place. But Saint Irenaeus. Uh, it's not clear what he's saying also because he says mm -hmm. convenir and convenir it usually means to come to a place or to arrive um, to agree with is sort of like a fifth or sixth level meaning um, down the list it rarely if ever means that but he could have he could have been meaning that and we really don't know what the um, what was meant by the translator when he wrote that because um, it's not like it's high classical Latin that he's writing, in, which is very well documented. Um, what I would say about St. Irenaeus, what he means is that, let me see if I can pull this up here. Okay, so the quotation you're talking about is this. Mm -hmm. He says, for it is a matter of necessity that every church should agree with this church on account of its preeminent authority. That's St. Irenaeus against Heresies, Book 3, Chapter 3. Okay, so it's odd that this person did not use other Latin words like consentire or ad sentior or congruere or um, uh, oboidire, or, uh, but he instead would, would use that to mean to agree to. Um, I don't quite get it, but if you listen to his other statements, he says in Against Heresies, book three, chapter four, one, he goes, suppose there arise a dispute relative to some important question among us. Should we not have recourse to the most ancient churches with which the apostles held constant intercourse and learn from them what is certain and clear in regard to the present question? For how should it be if the apostles themselves had not left us writings? Would it not be necessary in that case to follow the course of the tradition which they handed down to those whom they did commit to the churches? So you can see here, he's talking about how you go to apostolic churches to get answers, right? He then says this uh, earlier on in the book, uh, book one, chapter 10, two, he says, nor will I say any of the rulers of the churches, however highly gifted he may be in point of eloquence, teach doctrines different from these, for no one is greater than the master. Nor, on the other hand, will he who is deficient in power of expression inflict injury on the tradition. For the faith being ever one and the same, neither does one who is able, to great, to, able at great length to discourse regarding it make any addition to it, nor does one who can say little can say but little diminishes it. Okay, So you can see his understanding is that apostolic churches cannot go wrong because they inherited their faith from the apostles. So it's not that Rome specifically cannot go wrong. It's that Rome is the apostolic church in the West. And he is writing to a Western audience. If you had asked St. Irenaeus, could say Antioch go wrong? Well, from what he just said in these two quotes, his answer would be no, it's an apostolic see, absolutely not. Um, and you see this attitude pop up in the dispute between St. Stephen 
and St. Cyprian of Carthage right. about mm -hmm. rebaptism. Mm -hmm. St. Stephen, it, at least as I understand it, when I read it, it's not that Stephen is saying, I have a lineage from Peter, therefore I am right. It's, I have a lineage from Peter, who is an apostle, and you, Cyprian, do not have a lineage from an apostle, therefore I am right. Now, it should be noted that the church actually did not side with either Stephen or Cyprian, because Pope St. Stephen was accepting Gnostic and Marcionite baptisms. The church does not accept these. And St. Cyprian just said, we don't accept anyone's baptism. Well, the church also did not accept that, uh, except for some old calendarist groups who've tried to revive it. So in that, in that respect, I do not think that St. Irenaeus was speaking of Rome as being infallible. Uh, mm -hmm. We know in the case with Saint, Pope St. Victor, he went to, uh, he asked uh, the advice of councils throughout the West and in the Middle East even, as far as uh, uh, Babylon, and uh, on the opinion on when Easter should be celebrated. And all these councils come back saying it should be according to this date, not that one. And then he goes to excommunicate the churches of, uh, of Asia Minor for celebrating Easter on the 14th of Nisan. And St. Irenaeus, this is recorded by Eusebius uh, in his ecclesiastical history. Irenaeus stands up and goes, what are you doing? What is wrong with you? Um, and Victor had already sent the letters of excommunication. He'd already done it. And Irenaeus says, look, we remain at peace with these people. And to be at peace with, with the church, not to be in communion. So he was not holding up Victor's excommunication. He was, uh, you know, so the idea that Irenaeus would be a believer in, in papal infallibility, um, I, don't, I don't think it takes into account a holistic view of that saint's life and his writings. All right. Uh, let me now let me now go ahead to the Council of Ephesus. So I think you you're also familiar with what, what I'm going to say here. But basically, mm -hmm. Council of Ephesus, Ecumenical Council, 431 A.D. Um, Philip, right, the Roman Legate, he stands up and he says, "There is no doubt, and in fact, it has been known in all ages that the holy and most blessed Peter, prince and head of the apostles, pillar of the faith and foundation of the Catholic Church." received the keys of the kingdom from our Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior and Redeemer of the human race, and that to him was given the power of loosing and binding sins, who down even to today and forever, both lives and judges and his successors. So I'm not citing this as kind of like a gotcha quote, because I think that, you know, I, I've seen that there are ways that Orthodox um, scholars can interpret this passage without it necessarily entailing, right, what, what's said in Vatican I. But I'm just interested in then, you know, looking at this quote here and just getting y your read of it so that for the audience uh, who's Catholic, they can kind of see how does an Orthodox person approach a text like this? Because, right, I mean, for instance, I think um, you wouldn't deny, right, that in fact, it has been known in all ages that the Holy Most Blessed Peter, Prince and Head of the Apostles, Pillar of the Faith, Foundation of the Catholic Church, received the keys from our Lord Jesus Christ, right? And then... Um, I mean, as an Orthodox, you could basically look at that and say, yeah, you know, he's the, he's the holy and most blessed Peter, prince and head of the apostles, uh, the foundation of the Catholic Church. I mean, you could accept all that as an Orthodox person, correct? Right, right. We would definitely say that about Peter, but it should be understand that, or understood that our concept of, of we draw a distinction mm -hmm. between having a lineage from Peter and being a successor to Peter. Mm, so okay. we say the Pope of Rome, can you hear me okay, by the way? Yeah, yeah, you're good. I just set the, I just set the microphone down as I page through the Acts of Ephesus to find the uh, quotation you have there. Um, but we would say there's, you can have your lineage from Peter, for example, the Bishop of Rome, the Bishop of Alexandria, the Bishop of Antioch, um, and many other bishops have their lineage from St. Peter. Um, any community that St. Peter founded has its lineage from St. Peter, but to be a successor to Peter is what all bishops are. All bishops hold the keys. And so when you look at the patristic commentary on Petrine proof texts like John 21, 15 through 19, or uh, uh, 
Luke, uh, I believe it's uh, 22, 31, 32. The typical understanding of them is that it's, it's aimed at pastors, at bishops. It's instruction to bishops. I mean, St. John Chrysostom states so in uh, six books on the priesthood, um, when he's talking to his friend Basil, not Basil the Great Basil, um, he cites uh, John, um, John 21, uh, um, 15 and 19, 15 through 19. Yeah. Yeah. As a, as saying like, look, this is what you're tasked to do. St. Augustine also cites to this something that, you know, this is what all pastors are, are to do. Um, you have this famous quote from St. Cyprian letter 26, where he says, he quotes, uh, Matthew 16, uh, 17 through 19. And then he goes, this is spoken to bishops. It's like, okay, you know, I mean, and it goes on and on. It's, it's very rare early on that that is actually specifically applied onto the Bishop of Rome. And in fact, you mm -hmm. start to see that's applied onto the Bishop of Rome as Rome's secular status starts to wane. And it's no coincidence that the, the first like mentions you could say um, of, of Patrinity um, specifically applied onto Rome are, well, technically it's, it's the debacle between St. Cyprian and St. Stephan mm -hmm. in the mid uh, 300s. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's not really clear that he's actually bragging about Patrinity versus just apostolic succession or just, sorry, sorry, a, a, a ruling over a sea that, that, is, that is apostolic. Um, as all bishops have apostolic succession, but um, it, it's later on in the 300s that you really start to see hints of very direct, like, okay, Peter, Rome, like those Peter, Rome, therefore, you start to sort of see hints of it. And at this time, um, Rome was in steep decline. I, I think by the mid, mid 200s, Rome's, um, it was basically turning into a gigantic Detroit. Um, I mean, no offense to anyone from Detroit. I'm sure <laughs> yes. it, I'm sure your love, well, I'm sure some of you are lovely people. I, I don't, well, you have great listeners. So I'm sure all of you are lovely people. But um, it was turned to a huge Detroit and you had a, a half, half of the population left. This population was down near four to 500,000 people down from a million. Um, it was really in the dumps. I mean, and then by four, uh, 410, the city is sacked. Um, and that just horrifies everyone. How could the eternal city be sacked? Um, and then from there, just the decline just continues and continues and continues. And you start to get this impression that the popes, um, it's sort of like, uh, like when a, almost like an older sibling jealousy starts up. It's an, I'm still relevant. I'm still relevant, even though you have this baby or, Mm -hmm. Or maybe if we took like, say, Mormons or, or uh, Muslims or some other group that practices polygamy, it's, it's the, the husband gets a younger second wife and the, the older wife goes, no, no, I'm still important. It's like, well, not really. Uh, not really. Sorry, sweetie. Uh, but um, let me get this. I'm trying to find the actual specific quote because it's part of a much larger quotation that the legate gives, and it's it's actually in the um, in the uh, what's it called the um, the verdict that the council gives, um, where they excommunicate. Let me see if I can find it here. Do you have uh, anything else to say about um, Ephesus before I, uh, while I'm looking for this? No, I, I don't have anything else to say about Ephesus, but also like I did kind of just hoist that on you. And then, so I want to give you time to find the quote. I guess I have one last question and then we can, uh, you know, mm -hmm. kind of uh, ah, disband. Okay, Found sure. It. So let me, let me, let me let you talk. Yeah. Sorry. You're too kind. You're, you're such a gracious host. <laughs> 70 okay here we go so it's it's about a it's about a page is that okay if i read that yeah yeah read it and just tell us also where we can find it within the council itself yeah okay so you're going to have to buy a very expensive book but <laughs> the good news is the good news is it is coming out in paperback 
soon and paperback uh, it's about a third of the price that uh, I paid for it. Uh, so I have the hardback edition and it's the Council of Ephesus 431 mm -hmm. uh, translated by Richard Price with an introduction notes by Thomas Graumann is a German scholar. And uh, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. It has all of the letters before the council, all of them after. You get to see the exchanges between Nestorius and say John of Antioch. Uh, the, uh, John of Antioch, by the way, thought Nestorius was an idiot. Uh, he <laughs> likes to Nestor he, he gets He gets the letters from, uh, from the, the councils in Rome and then another one, because Rome excommunicates Nestorius, right? Mm -hmm. And then Rome sends a verdict to Alexandria. Alexandria then holds a council excommunicates Nestorius and then Cyril takes his 12 anathemas and then a couple other things pins them onto it without the without the the knowledge of the bishop of Rome then sends them to all of the major bishops in the east and they get to Antioch and before they get to Constantinople and then from Antioch uh, uh, several Antiochian bishops were there consecrating a bishop and John of Antioch immediately pens a letter to Nestorius. It gets to Nestorius before the Alexandrian uh, delegation gets to Constantinople and he goes, John goes, look Nestorius many, many venerable men such as Theodore of Mopsuestia have used the term Theotokos there's no problem with it they're giving you 10 days to think this over a wise man would not even need 24 hours, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it's, it's just absolutely snide remark. It's fantastic. Anyway, so here's what, here's what Philip the Legate says. It's on uh, page 378 of the Acts of the Council of Ephesus. Philip, the Presbyterian Legate of the Apostolic See said, it is doubtful to no one, rather it has been known in all ages that the holy and most blessed Peter, the leader and head of the apostles, pillar of the faith and the foundation of the Catholic church, received the keys of heaven from our Lord Jesus Christ, the savior and redeemer of the human race, and was given the power to bind and unloose sins, and that he lives and performs judgment until now and always through his successors. In accordance with this system, the successors and representative, our holy and most blessed Pope, Cele uh, Pope Bishop Celestine, has sent us to this council as substitutes for his presence, a council that was convoked by the most Christian, most philanthropic emperors, who keep in mind and always protect the Catholic faith and who have protected and protect the apostolic teaching handed down to them till this day by their most pious and most philanthropic fathers and grandfathers of holy memory, Taking thought for the council, as we have already said, they have decreed that the Catholic faith, which has been protected from ages past till this day, should continue as before, unshaken. Nestorius, the author of the new distortion and the fountainhead of all the evil, when summoned and cited, as we have learnt from the conciliar proceedings, scorned to come to the trial according to the ordinances of the fathers and the discipline of the canons, even though he ought to have offered himself spontaneously to so great and holy an assembly in order to receive spiritual healing and recover health. But when summoned to the Holy Council, as I've already said, canonically and according to the discipline of the canons, he refused to attend since he has a cauterized conscience, even though he was aware that not only the extension granted by the apostolic see, but many intervals of time had passed. It was therefore a secure judgment and regarding one who is in a hostile spirit and with an impious tongue dared to blaspheme against our Lord Jesus Christ and a decree of all the churches since they took part together in this priestly assembly through, though, through those present and through legates from the church in the east and west, the priests present for this reason. Following the ordinances of the fathers and the present holy council issued a decree against the rash blasphemer and historious and delivered a sentence to the effect that he who did not respect correction has his lot with the one of whom it was said, his episcopacy let another take. Therefore, let Nestorius know that he is banished from the communion of the priesthood of the Catholic Church. End quote. Pages 378 and 374 in Father Richard Price's the Council of Ephesus 431. What then follows is all the bishops sign on to it. So you'll notice there's something very important here. They first uh, depose him because he wouldn't show up to the council despite summon thrice. There's a canon, I don't recall which 
collections from, but it's used against Nestorius, as, or it's used against Dioscorus at Chalcedon as well. They're deposed for not showing up to the summons. And then from there, they pile on the dogmatic decrees. And the reason is that if you, if you can just depose someone who you don't agree with because you don't agree with them, you're going to have infinite splits. So they would have to find a canonical, I wouldn't say loophole, but they would have to say find a canonical reason to depose Nostorius. And they found it. They, they, I mean, you read the Acts, he, he won't show up. But what Philip is doing is he is ratifying the decrees of the council. The, the Roman legates came late to it. Um, they were held up. And so they get there, the Acts are explained to them everything that's gone on. And uh, they then agree that uh, Nestorius should be deposed. Um, now, it wasn't entirely the fault of the legates for being late. It was also that uh, Cyril uh, opens the council um, against the wishes of the emperor and the pope. He uh, opens it early by tricking the imperial uh, official, Count Candidianus, into reading the Sacra to everyone. Um, there's a sort of interesting scene where uh, Cyril goes, well, we should start the council. And Count Candidianus goes, no, you can't. And Cyril goes, well, what do you mean you can't? He goes, well, so in the decree, it says you can't. You know, Cyril goes, oh, it doesn't say that in the decree. And Candidianus says, yes, it does. And Cyril goes, prove it. And Candidianus opens the decree and just starts reading it like an idiot. And once it's read, well, the council started. And Candidianus doesn't realize it until he's finished reading it. And at that point, then they do this one day session, they, depose, they send three summons to Nestorius. And then from there, it, uh, it all unwinds. It's a fascinating story, but you can see that the, the papal legate, he's giving the ratification of the decrees and he's pointing out that the Pope is the head of the Synod. Um, and he's definitely trying to assert Rome's position in it, but I don't think he's trying to assert a position that we would find unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And it's important to realize the backstory in this about Cyril starting the council early. He sent documents to Nestorius that were without the knowledge of Rome. Cyril was essentially a loose cannon and he was tasked to be Rome's you could say not legate, but uh, sort of represent Rome at the council. And as time goes on, the Pope realizes, okay, the Cyril guy is way too wily. I need to send legates of my own, like independent of Cyril, right? This guy is just obnoxious. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's fantastically obnoxious. But, um, and so they're, they're coming in and they're sort of reminding Cyril, like, hey, like, you know, chill out like take yourself down a notch or two because you're i mean they, they called these patriarchs of of uh, alexandria they called them the pharaohs they were just so out of control i mean you have a uh, uh, theophilus of antioch who uh, or of uh, alexandria who uh, goes after saint john chrysostom gets him deposed at the synod of oak in 404 i think i'd have to check that but you know, and then you, then you have the situation with Cyril going after Nestorius. And then following that, I mean, you have the situation with Dioscorus going after Flavian. Um, but I would view that, that quotation through the lens of ratification and then them attempting to remind St. Cyril that like, look, you know, you're, you're not like the biggest guy around here. You're, you're, one, of, you're one of the bishops. Yeah, and I think, um, so this is going to be kind of my last question, but, um, you know, in preparation for our debate, which is happening in about an hour, um, I think there's, you know, oh. one question, one question to ask or to wonder about is, you know, to what extent, how do we understand the relationship between scripture and the fathers, right? Because on one hand, like we recognize, you know, the authority of ecumenical councils, um, we also recognize like, the, you know, the authority of scripture. And that, you know, the ecumenical councils won't say something against the scriptures, right? But, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. I find in um, some of my 
Eastern Orthodox friends or even Protestant, you know, uh, friends who have objections to the papacy, um, there, there seems to be this assumption that um, if Vatican I were correct, right, then, or, or yeah, if Vatican I papal theology were correct, then, you know, one of the fathers at least should have said it, right, or should have gotten it, right? Or for instance, like the Isaiah 22, 22, mm -hmm. Matthew 16, 19 parallel. I think uh, some of the Syriac fathers mention it in passing, although it's not very- Say Ephraim the Syrian right. mentions it, and then you see a, a quotation from Ephrahat, and then you, there's also a, an allusion that I think is probably the best of them, and that's um, St. John Cassian. Right, and these, these are in the 400s? Uh, Afrahat died in the 300s, St. Okay, Ephraim also in the 300s. St. Saint John Cassian, he actually, speaking of Council of Ephesus, yeah. he actually, because he could read Greek and Latin, he analyzed the writings of Nestorius and then wrote a refutation of them and gave it to Pope St. Celestine. Mm -hmm. So he was very heavily involved. Um, but yeah, anyway, sorry, I didn't no, interrupt. No, that was good. So uh, so the point that, I, the, po the question that I'm asking here is, um, Right. I mean, so for instance, one of the arguments that I would make, right, is that the scriptures seem to be saying something, at least one, one way in which I would interpret what's going on here as a Catholic, is I'd say that I think what I see Christ doing in Matthew 16, 19, right, is establishing something mm -hmm. that would take until Vatican I to be fully, finally understood in its fullness, right? Um, mm -hmm. Right. Whereas, you know, for as someone who's orthodox you would kind of say well i would expect at least one of the fathers to have gotten it along the way so then the problem here is that you know if you see the problem right i'm saying the scriptures seem to say this right but it seems and then i'm going to explain after the fact okay this is why it took so long to get it whereas you would say well i don't know if the scriptures necessarily say that and also the fathers nobody seems to pick it up for a while or at least come to the papal supremacist infallible conclusion that is Vatican I, right? So I'm, I'm interested then on just how do you understand the relationship between scripture and the fathers? And that's a big question and you can take that however you want. But um, I, I, think, I think it's worth mentioning kind of that difference in methodology. It is, it absolutely is, it's a great question. So one thing I would say and uh, I don't mean to, uh, I don't mean this to come off as, as flattery, but um, you as an apologist uh, create far better apologetics than most others that are pretty much, actually anyone I've interacted with so far, you create better stuff. And the reason is that you don't try to prove it from history. You take the doctrinal development approach. That is a lot harder to argue against on my side mm -hmm. than the historical argument. The historical argument can be taken down and dismantled rapidly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, rapidly. The one of doctrinal development, that takes a lot of time to start picking at. And it, yeah. because you have to go after all these assumptions beforehand, right? Mm -hmm. And so I would say that that uh uh yeah okay so so there's that but um one of the reasons why isaiah 22 22 is not cited by most of the fathers is because the term key is not actually in the majority septuagint text so if you look at the septuagint for that it says I will give him the glory of David. So this is why you don't actually hear like church fathers in the Greek East mm -hmm. talking about that verse. So that's just a side note, right? Um, you hear like Syriac fathers talk about it because they use the Masoretic text. Um, and then it appears in the in the Vulgate because Jerome used the, the uh, or proto-Masoretic, used the proto-Masoretic text for the Vulgate. Now, we would look at a situation like scripture and the church fathers and say, who are we to make assumptions when we are not deified? And they were and are, were and are, right? Um, I mean, 
it's a dangerous path to go down, down to read the, the New Testament or the Old Testament without the patristics. Um, if you do that, it's, it's very easy to end up at situations like Protestantism um, when you start getting your own interpretations. Now, in the case of Isaiah 22, 22, I, I don't think that, um, I don't think that that one really, I don't think it goes against Catholic ecclesiology in any way. So I think it would be a safe interpretation for your average Catholic to take up. Um, I also don't think that it goes against Orthodox Christian ecclesiology in any way um, for reasons we'll get into during the debate. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a safe interpretation there. In fact, a lot of, a lot of Orthodox apologists like Sarah from Hamilton or, or um, uh, Ben Bollinger, Ancient Insights, that's a good website. Um, they would argue that there is a connection. Um, I, would, I would also say that there is a connection there. Um, so we have to be careful though in how we look at scripture. There's a reason why so many church fathers wrote commentaries. It's very easy to head down the route of, of uh, you know, it's very easy to head down the route of why see it in the Bible, therefore. I mean, mm -hmm. Arius was able to pull up a lot, a lot of verses, Arius and Eunomius, um, that they thought supported their views. So that would be my take on it. It's just read it with the fathers. And I think if something doesn't go against the church fathers, it should be okay. But then again, I'm not really a scriptural exegete. My main area of interest is history and yeah. mm -hmm. um, languages. So whatever you do, I mean, if you want an official opinion on how the Orthodox Church looks at the Bible, go to the synods of bishops and see what they say. All right. Well, Ubi, thank you for my, this. Yeah. That's my disclaimer. <laughs> Ubi, that's thank my disclaimer right there. Before anyone's like you said. <laughs> Ubi, thank you for uh, coming on to my show. I think this is a maybe a good place to stop because we're already getting into the debate material. So um, I'll see you at two o'clock and I'm excited to have this conversation with you. And um, yeah, be I mean, fantastic. Looking forward to it too. All right, Ubi. Well, I'll talk to you later then. All right. You have a great one. Talk to you soon.